The fourth episode of Atlanta's third season is called The Big Payback. This is the second standalone story this season that doesn't involve our main characters at all. Now, the episode opens with a white man named Marshall listening to NPR while he's online at Starbucks. There's some kind of commotion with a black man who was in line ahead of Marshall, but he misses most of the conversation because he has headphones on. That distraction allows Marshall to walk out with a bag of cookies he didn't pay for. The white privilege is impossible to ignore, as is the nonchalant smirk on his face when he realizes what just happened. As Marshall pulls out of the parking lot, another car eerily follows him close behind. Marshall drives to his old home and picks up his daughter from his soon-to-be ex-wife. They're going through a separation, but you can tell he wants to be married and live in the house with them. Marshall drives his daughter to school, and on the radio we hear about an unprecedented legal case. A black man is suing Josh Beckford, a wealthy early investor in Tesla, because his ancestors owned slaves. According to the radio host, quote, that human capital and profit can be directly linked to the financials of the company. The black man in that case wins his lawsuit, and this opens the door for all descendants of slavery to sue the descendants of their slave owners, a.k.a. reparations. But not government-funded. This is direct compensation from the descendants of slave owners. And the white folks are shook. His white co-workers are freaking out. The wealthy investor who opened the door for these reparations is named Josh Beckford. In real life, Joshua Beckford is a young black genius with autism. At age six, he became the youngest person ever admitted to Oxford University. When Marshall gets to work, we see the same car that followed him out of the Starbucks lot earlier waiting for him. Inside, his bosses call an impromptu meeting to announce that the company is going through layoffs. Rumor has it that his company is being sued via the same Tesla clause. Marshall isn't panicking yet, but his other white co-workers are checking their background to see if they're potentially liable. On his drive home, Marshall sees a black guy with a brand new Lamborghini, thanks to his Apollo cheese. And truth be told, Marshall wasn't really concerned about all of this legal hoopla initially. But now, after his job's been affected, his co-workers have been targeted, and it's all anyone is talking about on the radio, Marshall can't seem to escape this Tesla clause. It even follows him home as some students in his daughter's class were teasing her by calling her a racist. He assures her that they are not racist and that their Hispanic gardener isn't a slave because they pay him. Marshall references their Austro-Hungarian heritage as a way to explain how ridiculous he thinks it is to ask for reparations, a comparison he later also uses with his co-worker who is relieved that her research has determined she's Ashkenazi Jewish and clear of any restitution payments. That night, before having dinner with his daughter, we see Marshall writing a note to his ex-wife asking her to have dinner with him, and it's clear that he wants to rebuild his family. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door, and Marshall is served a lawsuit by a Black woman named Shaniqua Johnson who claims his family owned her great-great-grandparents for 12 years, and now Marshall owes her $3 million as restitution. And this is a figure she arrives at after pushing her way into his house and live-streaming the whole thing. Marshall, completely blindsided, threatens to call the police, but Shaniqua points out that the law is on her side. He kicks her out of the house and asks his daughter not to mention this to her mother. But Marshall's wife does find out. I'm Peruvian. This would never happen to me. Per you were white yesterday. She's concerned about her finances taking a hit and presses him to finalize the divorce. And we have to mention the hilarious detail of Marshall's ex using the black emoji when she sends the we need to talk text. The next day at work, the office is half full. Most of the black employees who have gotten restitution payments either called out or quit. One of the white employees is forced to wear a shirt acknowledging his ancestor owned slaves. In the break room, Marshall turns to one of the few black co-workers who showed up to work, and he tells him about the Shaniqua situation and asks for his advice. His perspective from dealing with the black women in his life is to give her as much money as he can. Before he can get another sentence out, the camera hilariously and suddenly cuts to Marshall, asking his white co-workers for advice, a clear indication that he has no intention of paying her. Meanwhile, Shaniqua, who Marshall was expecting to be outside of his office with a megaphone, has instead hunkered down outside of Marshall's place. She and her family are barbecuing and listening to Keith Sweat make it last forever. So they spot Marshall, and before he can even park his car, Shaniqua sends her son Jason after him. Oh my God. <laughs> With Shaniqua occupying his apartment, Marshall checks into a hotel. The weight of everything, losing his family, his home, and potentially owing $3 million to Shaniqua is finally more than he can handle, and he breaks down alone in his hotel room, sobbing to himself with his complimentary cookie. He heads to the lobby to drown his sorrows when he meets another man who has been hit by the Tesla Claws. His name is Ernest, but we recognize him as the white man in the boat from the season three premiere, titled Three Slaps. 
You can click here to watch our detailed breakdown of that episode. Ernest, or E as his friends call him, has a completely different attitude than Marshall towards the restitution payments. While Marshall is defeated and angry that he's being held responsible for something he didn't do, Ernest offers him a different perspective. He likens slavery to more of a historical curiosity for white people. But for Black people, it's a ghost that haunts them for generations. E feels that now that there is a monetary value on the impact of slavery, white people like himself and Marshall are finally free. The curse lifted from her. All of us. E assures Marshall that whatever impact these restitution payments may have on their lives, that they'll likely make it through just fine. Just like Black people have made it through their historical disadvantages. E's words cause Marshall to think about his predicament differently. He checks out Shaniqua's Instagram and sees a video of her teaching her sons to ride their bikes. Now, this is the first time in the episode that we see her in a non-antagonistic light. E excuses himself for a smoke and steps outside, and we see him pull out a pistol and shoot himself in the head through the glass. The other hotel patrons are shocked, but one of the black waiters barely reacts with, more where that came from. The episode concludes with Marshall working as a waiter. He's either working a second job or has been laid off from his old job. Either way, all of the waiters who have to pay restitution taxes stay back, and his boss winces when he hears that Marshall has to pay a steep 15%. We cut to the inside of the upscale restaurant where the majority of the servers are white and the majority of the patrons are black. In this world, the restitution payments have flipped the socioeconomic conditions for black and white people, with more black people in the upper middle class. So what does all of this mean? Well, there's two stories being told here. One seems to be a running theme, or at least a loose thread, between all the season three standalone episodes. Each of these episodes explore the construct of race and how economics are inextricably linked. In the Three Slaps episode, we see a white lesbian couple who is delinquent on their bills and negligent to the point of abuse with their adopted children. But they're shielded by their privilege as white women and are allowed to keep on adopting while Laquarius is taken away from his mother for an innocuous disciplinary slap. Trini Turibon explores a hyperbolic example of the results of absentee parenting when a young white boy has a stronger connection with the culture of his deceased Trinidadian nanny than any connection he has with his parents. You can click the link here for our full recap video on that episode. And finally, Rich Wigga Poor Wigga examines a biracial teen who had the advantage of choosing whichever identity was most convenient until there's a monetary advantage to being Black in the form of free tuition. All of these episodes, including The Big Payback, explore this concept in their own unique and enthralling ways. But this episode also has implications toward the larger story and our main characters, specifically Earn. Though this story and its characters are mostly self-contained, E is a character who also appeared in Three Slaps on the Haunted Lake Lanier, and his missing bags referenced in this episode are delivered to Earn in the post credit scene for the season three finale. So how the hell did a man in Laquarius's dream, who was a boy in Earn's dream, end up losing his bags in this fictional world where white descendants of slave owners have to pay restitution tax to descendants of slaves? What does that all mean? We think the entire series is a waking dreamlike state for all of the characters. And that's why surreal things seem to happen at a moment's notice. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments, and you can click here for our recap of the entire Atlanta series, where we dive into this theory in even more detail. Also, be sure to subscribe and explore our other Atlanta videos. Thank you for watching both Aunt Vivs. We'll see you next time.